everyone in this world seems to have his own special problems. Yet they are all the same and must be recognized as one if the one solution that solves them all is to be accepted. Who can see that a problem has been solved if he thinks the problem is something else? Even if he is given the answer, he cannot see its relevance. This, that is the position in which you find yourself now. You have the answer, but you are still uncertain about what the problem is. A long series of different problems seems to confront you and as one is settled, the next one and the next arise. There seems to be no end to them. There is no time in which you feel completely free of problems and at peace. So that's a good starting point for us, because whether we talk about um, personal issues and problems, perhaps there's um, feelings of of anger or hatred or grievances with a person, or um, perhaps there's medical problems or seeming problems with the body, um, different aches and pains or different diseases and sicknesses, or whether we're talking more on uh, a collective uh, scale of social issues, you know, abortion and um, gay rights or, you know, on and on, so on and so forth, that there seems to be a, a wide array of problems, and what we're going to do this morning is is bring it bring it back to to the mind and and redefine the problem, redefine what we perceive to be the problem. So the first thing we have to do to really talk about bringing it back to the mind is kind of get into a little bit of a discussion about what is the mind. Um, and how it how is that differentiated from the world that the eyes see and the ears hear? The world of uh, of change and uh, constant fluctuation, and so on and so forth. And we have the term mind. I think it, it would be helpful to start out by saying the mind is not um, contained in the world. The mind is not analogous to the brain. But the mind is, uh, you could use a Course in Miracles definition, the activating agent of spirit. It is, um, it is very powerful. It is um, the place or the um, mechanism of uh, decision making is contained within the mind and it, it is uh, abstract. It is not, there's nothing that we can use as a metaphor or a real good analogy that is in the world because the mind is, um, is not limited in everything in the world that we see is limited and fragmented in some way. So maybe we can just take a particular uh, type of a, an issue that you have or question that you have in, in a, for a particular and work it back using our, our framework that we've just set up that there are no problems apart from the mind. Um, why don't we take what I was looking at last week when I was staying with the boys and um, being in an environment that was much noisier and much more active than, I'm, than I often am and just having the thought that, um, that I still need to be in a quiet external environment to have my internal environment quiet. I mean, I noticed I still had that belief that, 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 that in some way my internal state of mind was dependent on the, the volume level or the activity level in the external condition. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you the, you perceived the problem was the problem of environment. Mm -hmm. Everything. Okay, if we bring that back to the mind and where we begin our discussion with the presenting problem is that there are are certain circumstances or situations that you're perceiving that are outside of yourself mm -hmm. that are undesirable. And if we bring it back to the metaphysics of the Course, you can see that the, one of the basic premises is there's nothing outside of you, and that the inner world and the outer world are not different, but are actually one and the same and simultaneous. And the belief that they are different um, sets up a, a, a situation or a conflict in that you know it would be more it would be better or more conducive to me if I were in a different um, situation or a different place. So it gets down to that belief that um, first of all that I'm in the environment. I mm -hmm. mean. I think if, if we look and we listen to our words, that they really convey what we believe, and they can be used as, as trigger points or as clues to what we really believe. To First of all, to believe that, that one is in an environment, um, it gets back to the belief that I, I am a person who is in the world and moving distinct from the world. I, there's a belief that I'm a person, I can act on the world, and the world can act on, on me. And in a sense, the deepest sense, we have a subject-object split. You know, the I, I am a subject in the world. I, you know, the I, I am a subject in the world. I subjectively perceive the world. Um, I have feelings, I have emotions, I have likes, I have dislikes, I, I have the ability to, to make decisions as a person, and the belief is other people have the, have the ability to make decisions as a person. And so, in the ultimate sense, it's that split between subject and object that gets to the uncomfortableness that you feel in those situations with a lot of seeming activity or noise levels and so on and so forth. The, the problem as defined in the world seems to be, you know, if, if it was quieter or if I, there was less activity, then I could be at peace. My mind at least could be more still than otherwise. Yeah. And so when we listen to how that's described in that definition, it's obvious that, that the state of mind or the peace of mind is dependent on the environment mm -hmm. in that case. And to take it one step further, as we've just done, the environment is something that is not me, that is apart from me that isn't, in a sense, objectified. There is something that we can call an objectifiable environment. For instance, the house um, and the boys that you were staying with is, is being part of that objectifiable environment in which I find myself. That's where the split comes in, mm -hmm. between the inner and the outer in my mind. Mm -hmm. It's a very basic split. It's a subject-object split, and the subject is seen to be I'm a person, and then the object can be another object, another person, the environment. Everything outside of me, in other words, what I perceive as me. Right. Everything what, what outside of what you perceive as you. So in a sense, mm -hmm. there's the split that's taking place. Mm -hmm. And this split is, is in the mind. This is a, a choice. This is a, a way of perceiving that the mind has chosen. Now, to to uh, fuse the split, to to see no duality between oneself and the world, um, can seem to be, you know, like a big leap. It can seem to be um, 
uh, unfathomable. It can seem at times to be impossible. It can seem to be um, as if there's no experiential um, grounding or basis for that, that, it's, that that can be an idea and so on and so forth. But really, the first step and really transcending that split or letting that split go in the mind is to take a little bit of a look at the dynamics of why. If it's a very basic split th that I have chosen to, to make, why does the mind make that split? And do you have any idea of that from, from any of our previous discussions? Why, what purpose does it serve the mind to, to split into a subject-object? Um, well, I think all the duality that's projected is, a, is the mind's uh, attempt to relieve the pressure as it were, from trying to maintain within it two different and opposing and conflicting thought systems. And so the mind tries to throw one outside of itself and attempt to, you know, just ease that and make it more feel more comfortable and more manageable and less conflictual. And in throwing, throwing it outside of itself, that's how the duality is set up. That, that then the duality is experienced as being outside of the mind instead of inside the mind, where it's intolerable. And it doesn't really go away inside the mind, but there's kind of a pseudo-belief or a misconception that, that it will in some way relieve that conflict in the mind to get it outside of itself. Mm -hmm. You say intolerable. I mean, are, have, are you gaining a sense of um, of the the force of of the mind of the of the um, strength of this intolerance, in the sense that you know as you go along moment by moment and you do experience these instances of wanting to define the problem in the world, it it has to be an indicator that. Um, there is a tremendous amount of fear, or there is something that is really attempting to be run from, or hid from, or avoided, to continually continue the, the projecting game of, of, of blaming, or of, in all kinds of ways, looking to define the problem in the world. The mind insistently trying to, to define the problem over and over and over again as being in the world. Mm -hmm. So are you, I mean, are you talking about the, just the, the fear, the basic fear that's in the mind, the fear of God, the fear of love, and the fear of, you know, uh, the punishment that's deserving from the guilt that comes from, the, the having separated from God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and that, that can seem very abstract, or, or a lot of times it, a common thing is, People say, I, I'm not in touch with that. I don't really um, see that that I'm afraid of God or I'm afraid of love. You know, it, the, the metaphysical connections that you've made, this is what it comes down to in this um, hypothetical or presenting problem that we're talking about of, of wanting the environment to be in some way different, mm -hmm. you know, it, some way stating the problem is I, I, I'm not at peace, and I could be at peace if something were different in my environment, and it's that throwing it out, I mean, this is like one teeny sliver or one presenting problem of that, but this is the, the core of what goes on in this world is a defense against um, coming to know that there's only one problem, the solution. So was that a question? No. Oh, okay. <laughs>